Thank you, Brother Turner. What a privilege, again I say, and very sincerely, what a privilege for Rachel and I to be here with you this week. We have thoroughly enjoyed it. I have enjoyed being here and being in the home. Now, uh, all those nice things I think that he was trying to say, I can't understand why I was trying to give him counsel and serious advice and he would just laugh. And, and I don't understand all that, but I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed being with him and, and with her. They have been gracious hosts. They're busy. They're exceptionally busy. They're worn to a frazzle. Uh, you can't always tell it to look at them. Then again, well, anyway, they're worn to a frazzle. And, uh, and just let me encourage you as a congregation. I hope, I hope you're aware of what you have here as a pastor. I hope you're aware of how much they care about you and your community, and they give of themselves to minister to you. They're patient with you, maybe. Uh, they care about you positively. And so you just keep minding God. You keep walking in the light. The Lord deals with you about something. Don't take that as an indicator that, that you can't make it. He's helping you, and he will help you. Make the adjustments if the Lord speaks to you. And uh, I was a slow learner when it comes to spiritual things. I just didn't know. But oh, how good the Lord was to help me. And so thank you for all your kindnesses. There were things brought in. There were things here when we got here and then through the meeting. I don't know what all has been brought into the parsonage to help uh, fatten us up and take care of us. But there were all kinds of little kindnesses. Thank you so very much. And uh, I notice often because I used to in our conference, visit our churches, different churches. And, and I just like to go into a church and I'm not doing it to be critical, but you come here, it's inviting, the lights are on. Uh, you got somebody at the door, all but once he was at the door. One time he was derelict of his duty and I was getting ready to step on his toes, but he quick got back in place. He just admitted right out that he was gabbing. <laughs> But, uh, but boy, you had somebody at the door. I mean, they just saw you come and the door automatically opens and it's inviting to come in and somebody cleans the place. I mean, you know, every six months somebody sweeps <laughs> and uh, the church is so nice and I commend you for that. I really do. And then, of course, you're, you're, you're attempting to reach out in various ways. You have an extension ministry to the West Virginians, and anybody that knows West Virginia, they need an extended ministry. You people back there sitting back in your recliner right now drinking Pepsi Cola and eating popcorn, we don't have that in here, okay? And, uh, and they passed the plates, by the way, and got some of our money. So, you know, you're safe from all that, but we're still glad that you're connected. We're glad that you listen in. And uh, I even went a little bit, my wife actually, because I don't know how to do it. I'm still trying to figure out how to get my eight track to play, if any of you remember those. But uh, my wife even went on somehow and got Pastor Scott uh, from a sermon in the past, an archival thing of some sort. And uh, I was listening to him a little bit today. And, boy, it's kind of neat because you can turn him off. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing I know you can do with me. If you're out there in Wawa land, we don't know where you are. And we don't know what you're doing. And it's obvious if we get up and walk out and then come back in with a Pepsi Cola in our hand, we, we don't commonly do that in church. But if you're in home, I guess you could do that. But we're still glad that there's still here and there, there's an interest in some people's hearts to hear the word of God. And uh, boy, you, you come and you see the people taking their places. And I'm just going to kind of miss that. 
from time to time. So every once in a while, be assured, we'll be thinking of you. You, you might pop up in our mind, and even though it may startle us at times, <laughs> we'll remember you. And if ever we come to your mind, just breathe a little, a little word of prayer. Even if you're walking your dog snowball or peaches or, or whatever it is, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. I like a dog with a good name. A, a boy needs a good dog. And growing up, I had a beagle. Most of him was beagle. There was a little bit of something else that snuck in there that we were never quite sure. My dog was Nicodemus. <laughs> Nicodemus. Nicodemus was my dog. I like a good dog name. And I heard a fella here has one by the name of Snowball. I think that'd be a good name for a dog, especially in the wintertime. And, uh, you know, some people get dogs and give them little sissy names like Peaches. Peaches. How would you like to be a dog? And they call you Peaches. Always scared they're going to make a cobbler out of you, <laughs> you know. But anyway, anyway, I've enjoyed kind of carrying on with you a little. I don't purposely try to just get a reputation of just being a total joke because there's nothing funny about the Word of God. There's nothing funny about on purpose taking the way of the cross and being an old-fashioned Christian. Boy, I've, I've enjoyed watching some of you. I've heard your testimonies, and, and, um, and I'll tell you what, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. It's not always exactly where we are, but it's where we're headed. It's the direction we're going, so always keep that in mind. You know, I might not be, be what I, all what I ought to be, but I'm on a, I'm on a reach for God, and I'm going to try to please him with my life, and Good to see the folks get some light and come back up front here where they belong. I'll tell you, you always like to have the ornery ones right up front. You know what I mean? Yep. And so they're up here. I'm not going to get too close because he might bop me. I don't know if he's got anything to bop me with, but she could shoot me with her atomic, whatever that thing is. But, uh, and, of course, I've enjoyed seeing the whole family back here and stretches over across the aisle. And then this little click back in here. And, and then a few of them that he chases his whole family away during revival. But when they get back, you preach to them. You hear me? And, uh, and then, of course, the folks that insist on sitting on the back seat so as to prove that this is indeed a holiness church. We've got to have somebody on the back seat, even if the front seats are always empty. And that way I feel comfortable. I'm in a wholeness church. Well, thank you for minding the Lord. Thank you for your kindness uh, to us. And, um, and uh, I just trust God will continue to be with you and bless you. Pray for your pastor and his family. Uh, we've had a great time in the parsonage, but it dawned on me today that we have to be in the special room that ordinarily their little relative urchins uh, come into, because I'm going to tell you, they were around about today. I tell you, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. But we have totally disrupted the parsonage. And after tomorrow, because they're going to go out a big celebration that they got rid of us, after tomorrow, they'll be able to get it back that Grandma, well, Papa and Nana, Mamo, Mamo, Mama, Banana, whatever she is, they'll. They'll get it back to normal, okay? Where we come from, I'm grandpa and grandma, which is pretty simple. <laughs> they don't come any simpler than us, I guess, but uh, so good to see you. Good to see some folks that we know from back in Pennsylvania. And uh, if ever you get to come to Pennsylvania, come to Penn's Creek, come to Penn View and visit us. We are cabin number four. Rachel and I actually, in what many people think are retirement, although we're not overly retired yet, uh, we live in cabin number four. We left a 12-room 
two-story house on Main Street in Middleburg, sold it, and moved into a two-room cabin on campus. Minor adjustments to get used to it. You learn when you go down the hall and meet one another, you synchronize so that one turns one way, one turns the other way. Uh, you have to, or we'd be stuck there and still be lodged into the place. But uh, I tell people, well, if nothing else, moving from 12 rooms to two has brought us closer together. We're enjoying it. We've enjoyed being with you this week. Pray for us. If we ever come to mind, we leave here and go back to a place called Delaware, Ohio. I have never been to. They don't even have a pastor. And we're going there from here. So if you think of it, pray for us. But anyway, what I was going to say, you're invited to come and visit us any time that we're there uh, in cabin number four. We can't put you all up at once. Well, we could try, but it probably wouldn't work. Over in what I told you is one of my favorite chapters of Scripture, Matthew chapter 11. That is the chapter where Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But I want to call your attention just briefly tonight. I say briefly, and, and that's my intent. Jesus deals with some problems that arose in his ministry. Opposition to his preaching. John the Baptist preceded him. They didn't like John the Baptist. Jesus began his earthly ministry, and they didn't like Jesus. He tells us about it in, in chapter 11, in verse 18. He said, John came neither eating and drinking. Now, of course, John ate and, and John drank. But what he's saying there, John was not a mixer. Uh, you know, he you wouldn't see him around at gatherings and get togethers and things like that. John was a kind of an unusual man, but he was a preacher of the gospel. And But they didn't like him. They said, he has a devil in verse 18. Now he said, the son of man, which was Jesus, came eating and drinking. Jesus mixed and mingled. He was always with a crowd of people, sinners and publicans and whoever. Jesus mixed and mingled. And so he was the opposite of John. He came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. So I just bring your attention to that, that there was, they didn't like John, who had a certain style of ministry. They didn't like Jesus, who had a different yet style of ministry. And so Jesus, out of that, says, Where unto, in verse 16, shall I liken this generation? I hardly have ever preached this for a last night service of a revival. But for some reason, I felt just inclined that direction tonight. And with what's happened already in the service, it verifies to me that the Lord wants me to simply remind this little crowd of something about ourselves and something about him. Okay? Jesus said, Whereunto shall I liken this generation? Chapter 11 of Matthew, verse 16. And this is what he said. It is like unto children. I've been teasing the little boys and girls. I call them little urchins. And I've been teasing them. I like, I like boys and girls. I was in Florida to a congregation of people where I was preaching, and I was about the youngest person there. It was a congregation of older people. There were no teenagers with dogs. 
There were no little urchins running around. It was all old people. And I looked at them, and I wasn't just trying to be overly smart, but I said, one of two things. You people here, you've either got to knock on doors and get some visitors in, or you've got to have some babies. Because if we don't get these boys and girls in, and we don't have any of these young people in that step in and follow after us, after our generation is gone, there'll be nothing left. And so I like, I like a congregation that's got some children running around underfoot, getting our attention every once in a while. And so here Jesus said, whereunto shall I liken this generation? He said, it's like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, we have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. And in those words of Jesus, I want to remind us of what Jesus was trying to tell us concerning uh, the little children that we'll remember when this meeting is over, okay? Years ago, Rachel and I in the parsonage where we were pastoring, one day out of the clear blue, I mean, just totally unexpected, one of our boys, we had three boys, Jim and John and Andy, but it was probably Jim or John, one of our boys all of a sudden unexpectedly just went running through the house, just shouting, just shouting, screaming. And I come running to see what was wrong, only to discover they were playing church. They were playing church, and I don't know how much you're used to that, but there was a day in yesteryear where occasionally, where occasionally the Spirit of God would settle in on a congregation of people and they get excited. And the saints used to shout. They used to weep. They used to shout. They used to run the aisles. They really did. I'm not trying to talk of fanaticism, but I'm just saying out of excitement. You and I are critters of excitement. Do you know that? We have emotions. Oh, we act pious, and sober, and dead sometimes. But you let a great big fat rat come running through here all of a sudden, and there'd be saints from West Virginia running the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I remember when I went to camp meeting and first ever heard a, a, a lady, it happened to be a lady, but shouted and it scared me. I'm a teenager. I haven't been saved long. I thought, what have I got into? And here's how the Lord dealt with me. He said, Harry, remember, remember before I saved you, remember on the basketball team when you guys would be playing Elkland or Mansfield or Williamson or Wellsboro? And you guys come down, you know, and put a shot up and make it, and it's a close game. Remember how the people used to come, and they're in the, in, in the uh, gymnasium and those bleachers in a close game. Not only were the cheerleaders doing things, but the people like us from the, from the community, they'd say, yay, you know, yay. I've seen them take and throw a hat, a dress hat. I've seen them throw a hat, and who knows where it went, and who, I often wonder, did they ever get it back? I've seen them throw themselves right back into the lap of whoever was sitting behind them, right into their lap, and that guy reach up and tossle their hair. You try that. You do it right now to whoever's in front of you. Try it and see what reaction. To tossle his hair. Huh? You know, but, but here's the thing. The Lord reminded me, those people did that, and nobody 
took them to task, Brother Turner, and said, man, you're, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. And so all I'm saying is the Lord explained it to me. Harry, sometimes my coming, my coming, my presence, like we felt here tonight, you know, my presence in the service reminds that man or that woman of what they were back when I found them, where they were headed and what their, what their life was and the mess they made of it. And, and Jesus passed by and Jesus reached out and we saw him and he came down to where I was and put his arm around me and it thrills us. So every once in a while we have a right to cry or to shout, or to get up and take a walk. Every once in a while we have to. So, so we had a lady that did that sometimes, and here when Jim or John was screaming his head off like a Comanche Indian, not that Comanche Indians screamed their heads off, but could have been an Apache. But anyhow, when I come running here, they were playing church, and he was blessed. I say that because Jesus said, whereunto do I reckon or liken this generation? He said, it's like, he says, come with me to the marketplace. Marketplace back home is where the vendors set up their tables, you know, and sell their wares. They'll have carrots, they'll have turnips, they'll have cabbage heads, they'll have sweet corn, they'll have string beans, and sometimes they have other things. Uh, a part of our market, which where I come from, was on Tuesdays. You could go back into a little area off to the side, and there you could, there, there'd be an auctioneer going through. And uh, who give a dollar, go a dollar bill? Anybody got a dollar bill? You could actually buy a chicken. I mean, a live chicken, not a Purdue oven stuffer. <laughs> you could buy a string bean, pure leather, <laughs> good gravy maker but a lot of work to get it to that place, <laughs> you know, for a little bit of nothing. And later on, around noon, you could go into the big arena and sit around that looked like a gladiator place, and they'd bring a cow in, and you could bid, bid on bossy. I'm not going to say what I thought about saying. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. So marketplace is a busy part of a community if you have one. And Jesus in his times knew what it was to go to marketplace while all the, the people are coming in and they're plying their trade and they're making their trades and their purchases and a lot of activity. But what Jesus draws our attention to when he says, whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like the little boys and girls, the little urchins in market. I've seen them. And, and what he's saying is little boys and girls are imitations of big boys and girls. Uh, just like our son in the parsonage was mimicking or copying uh, one of our saints in the church, uh, your little kids, whether you really want to own up to it or not, are little Ewans. I don't know if that's the right usage of, of a word, because I wasn't valedictorian in my class. I come close. There was only 63 that beat me. <laughs> but I'm saying that little kids, little kids are little usms. They, they bear resemblance to us. They have a right to. We have a right to almost be proud of that. Almost. We hope there's slight improvement. But these little kids, Jesus said, early in life are observers. And they watch. And you, you get around them. They like to play grown-up games. You know, you get, that's been part of the trial of having us in the parsonage. The grandkids can't come in and be utter maniacs like they are normally. 
because they're trying to impress us, forgetting that we're grandpa and grandma too. We totally know that this is abnormal the way they're acting this week. They like to come and get their trucks out and they're running the highway and they're, they're, they're getting their little Tonka graders out and they're making roads and they're digging ditches and they're doing grown up things. Maybe they're climbing up into trees and doctoring them because I heard we have a tree doctor here. I know some trees back home that need a doctor. <laughs> they need a chainsaw is what they need, some of them, but... But Jesus said, whereunto shall I liken this generation like little kids playing games? And I've got I've to hurry up with this. But he says, look at them. He said, you know what they're doing? These little kids in the marketplace, they're playing wedding. Now, listen, when I illustrate this, I'm not saying this to bring up any, any feelings or any thoughts or any hurts. Because I've been around the barn enough to know that in our communities and in our churches and in our lives, there are some disappointments and there are some disasters, frankly, when it comes to homes. But I'm just saying that Jesus is giving the illustration. So he is giving the illustration as though it is illustrating the God-given design for a home. And the God-given design and plan for a home is that marriages do, in fact, start homes and their, their, their uh, activities that are filled with anticipation. You know, there was a wedding this week that competed with this revival. There was a wedding yesterday that Rachel and I drove all the way to Indianapolis to what some term the royal wedding of Paul Stetler, who a lot of us knew Paul Stetler. We know him, and we thought he will never get married because who would want him? <laughs> but Jacinda saw him, and she was infatuated with him. And there's somebody for everybody if... if... But, but Jesus said, watch them. And, and in our mind, we can see them in the marketplace. Keep in mind all the activity, all the business, all the vendors, all the booths, all that going on. And in the midst of it, midst of it are all these little kids. And Jesus said, the little kids are playing wedding and they're running around saying, come on, back there, you guys wake up. We're playing wedding. Come on. We want you to be part of it. Come on. And over here, you people, some of you get too old, but we, we want you to get excited about it. We're going to have a wedding. Come on. Huh? And you can see them. I can almost see them. Now, listen, let me tell you, I'm not an expert on this. Although I'm a minister and I've conducted weddings, I never played wedding growing up. I'm just telling you. My brothers and my boy cousins and I never played wedding. We played cowboys and Indians. Yes, sir. I rode with Custer at the Little Bighorn from, my, from our hay mow on my hay horse. Yes, sir. I fought with Davy Crockett in the Alamo. Uh -huh. Then one day I realized, hey, the guys I'm riding with are losers. <laughs> But girls, girls are the ones that mostly, I think, play wedding. But I'll tell you what, we've got some granddaughters. And when we lived in that big house on Main Street in Middleburg, we had all those rooms. And at one time, it had been a divided home. I mean by that, it, it, it was for two, two different people, to live, two different families. But, it, but long before we bought it, it had been converted back to just one dwelling. And so we, were, we had it. But you could go back through the house, and coming out the one back side, there was a, a porch that one time had been the second entrance. And it was no longer used that way. It could have been, but it wasn't being used that way. But it had never been finished off. Uh, it was all open rafters and studding. And it was actually kind of a quaint man cave, hunter's paradise type place. 
but but we chose to make it a playroom for our grandkids kind of like where the room we're staying in in this revival is the playroom <laughs> for the grandkids so you can only imagine their feelings toward us is these guys are in our playroom <laughs> but anyway Anyway, we had a playroom, and when our grandgirls would come, Jennifer and Ashley and Lauren especially, and some of their playmates, they'd go back in there, and we gave them license. I mean, they could hardly hurt anything, hardly. And they could go in there and just have a time. And my wife had an old tote, plastic tote back in the corner that when my car would stall out at yard sales, and I would be looking for tools to fix it. She'd be looking for material and dresses and funny stuff like pillowcases and sheets and old stuff and, and even found a wedding gown. You don't ask why the wedding gown is in the yard sale. Okay, you don't ask. She just bought it. And, and fold it all up and stuffed it down in there. And here comes our girls, and you wouldn't hear anything from them. I mean, that playroom was worth the price of the purchase of the house. But after a while, you go out of our dining hall into our living room, and the living room has been transformed. They have pushed coffee table back. They have set things aside. They have covered over with sheets our recliners, our sofa. They have taken things out of that, those totes that grandma had back there and brought it out and covered this, and covered this, and displaced this, got it all set up. Plastic flowers. I don't necessarily think they were cemetery flowers, but if they were, I don't know where she got them, but they'd lost their color. Her, her mom, it's, it's an inherited thing. Her mom used to have these plastic artificial flowers, and when she'd go away, she'd make big cardboard signs, artificial, do not water, and hang them on them. Well, I tried to tell mom, Will, anybody, anybody from a hundred yards away can look at them and know they're artificial and know that water will do them no good. But go ahead, hang your signs on them. But anyway, these girls would cover all this stuff, have little bouquets of plastic flowers here and there, and there would be a runner, a runner all the way through our living room over here into my study and through it and going in mysteriously to the playroom. And invariably, after a while, here'd come Jennifer, dressed in, her, in the wedding gown. Jennifer was always the bride. She's the oldest grand. Always Jennifer was the bride. I've teased her. It was a different groom every week, but <laughs> always she was the bride. And, and here she comes. Now, I don't have this just right because understand, we never played wedding. But here she'd come. Through my study. Into the living room. Here'd come Ashley. And you'd have to know my grandkids, but here'd come Lauren. <laughs> you know, here they'd come, playing wedding. So I could picture this, though I've never played it. I can picture the marketplace. And Jesus said, and here's, here's what I want to get across. Jesus said, whereunto do I liken this generation? 
Remember, he's telling this out of this rejection that's developed. They don't like John the Baptist. They don't like Jesus. And so Jesus said, I liken this generation to little kids in the market playing wedding. And they're excited. They're saying, come on, come and play. What the Lord wants me to remind you of tonight, church, if you can only see it, is that it's like the last part of this chapter that I told you is my favorite, almost my favorite chapter, where he said, come unto me. He's inviting He's saying, come on. He's reminding us that the Spirit of God, and, and what affirmed this to me tonight was in a, in a real way while we were singing, the Spirit was moving and inviting, and different ones of you wisely responded and stepped out. And that's exactly he's saying. Jesus is saying this about God. He's saying it's like the invitation of the little children in the marketplace. You're all invited. All invited. I talked with somebody, I can't remember who it was in the last little while, and we went to the royal wedding yesterday in Indianapolis. They said we weren't invited. But with Jesus, you're all invited. He doesn't, he doesn't leave out any of you. And I just simply remind you tonight that Jesus, I believe, is telling us that the Spirit of God likes to come. Likes to come to Muncie. Next week we'll be in Delaware, Ohio. He likes to go there. And he likes to come by to men and women and say, come on, you can be a part of this. The excitement of a wedding. You know, weddings are always exciting. On purpose, they get the invitations out and people begin to talk. They even get ahead of, ahead of the actual wedding and practice. So they say the right things and know when to give them the kiss. It's exciting. And I've seen little girls at a wedding. You know where they like to sit, Brother Gordon? Right where you're sitting. Right next to the aisle. And they'll sit there and their eyes will get big and bright. And they'll look back where the bride's going to come up. And they'll look up where the groom is shivering. <laughs> and they're all excited. They're all excited. But Jesus is saying, there's an excitement in coming to me. He's saying, I'm inviting you to something better than what you're used to as a sinner. I'm inviting you to something more exciting than what you've been used to as a sinner. I'm inviting you as, as a wedding. It's a place that you can come and be a part. You can enjoy the moment. You can observe the commitment. I'm, I'm welcoming you to to likewise be a part of that commitment, to on purpose decide to go with God. I always liked, I always liked before I ever got saved, before I ever got saved, I used to listen back in the yesteryear, way back there, I used to listen to Billy Graham. I'm just telling you, there were times when Billy Graham would preach, and as a boy that was unchurched, I'd be under conviction. Always liked the title of his program, The Hour of Decision. The Hour of Decision. Jesus is telling us that the Spirit of God on purpose comes and says, like a wedding, like the little kids in the marketplace, every one of you is invited. Nobody's left out. He doesn't want anybody to fall through the cracks. Overlooked. You're all welcome to come. Come and play with us. We're playing wedding. It's good to go with God. But he said you wouldn't. He said we piped unto you. The wedding music, we piped unto you. And you won't dance. You won't be happy. 
You won't play. You won't come. You won't participate. You know, one of the saddest things to me, church, is to get down to the end of a revival. One thing that's sad to me is that in reality, there are some people, there are some people that maybe we'll never see again because we're not from here and we didn't know you when we come and when we leave, we'll lose track. That's to me a little sad. I can get sentimental about that. But the sadder thing yet is that some people in a revival decide their hour of decision. They decide not to come to the wedding. I won't play. I won't be a part. When God's saying, I want you to be, I invite you to be, I wish you would. And I wish you would too. I think God likes to invite a sinner to be a Christian with the excitement and anticipation like a wedding. It's a commitment, but it's a joyous one. Come unto me. But you wouldn't. So in closing, he said, well, if, if you won't play wedding, the boys and girls said, well, then another thing they learn in life besides weddings is the fact of funerals. That's totally different. It's the other side of the coin. Funerals aren't the joy and the anticipation and the excitement of a wedding. When our kids were growing up, anything that died in close proximity to the parsonage had to have a Christian burial. It could be a rabbit that a car run over. It could be a turtle out of John's collection back in those days. It could be a sparrow. It could be a lizard. And I can still remember our boys as little boys standing in solemnity in a little semicircle around a little dug grave with a homemade stick cross. And momentarily, we pretended we grieved. We'd bow our head, say a word or two over it, and bury the decaying corpse of the rabbit. We even buried a goat. I'm almost ashamed to admit it, Doc. I had a goat in our garage, <laughs> and I'd milk it, made good homemade ice cream with it. But it died, which curtailed the business. <laughs> it died, and we buried it. We buried it with a creek that was down at the edge of our property. The difficulty was the creek would flood, and it kept bringing the goat back up. <laughs> and we had to bury the crazy thing three or four times. I can't remember altogether. I began to think it was a cat <laughs> with nine lives. <laughs> It'd, it'd come back and I'd bury it again. <laughs> John had a, had a pair of doves or something, <laughs> doves or cockatiels or something that somebody in the church had given him. And, of course, my wife is death on anything that's alive in the parsonage, inside the parsonage, except human beings. And so she made John keep the doves down in the basement. And our youngest boy, Andy decided one day to go down there and teach the doves how to fly. So he reached in the cage, didn't ask anybody because he thought he was good at it. He reached in and got one of those beautiful birds. They were pretty. They were like a little pigeon, little dovish thing. And he took it and threw it with all of his might into the floor joists and broke its neck. That was a sad funeral. Yeah. And, and John's reaction to it, I almost thought it was going to have to bury Andy with it. <laughs> telling you. But all that being said, Jesus said, because, because you won't come, 
with the anticipation and the excitement, and we're almost done here because some of you are looking at the clock. It's 25 after seven, okay? We should be out of here in another hour for sure. The only reason I say that is I've seen you stand around after we're done and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. So I cannot accurately predict when you will go out. I can tell you I'm going to be done within an hour. I'm going to be done probably within five or ten minutes. Jesus said, because you won't come and play wedding. The boys and girls said, but we want you to come and be a part. So if you don't want to play wedding, let's play funeral. Let's lament. Let's mourn together. Because grown-ups go to funerals. What Jesus is saying is that the Holy Spirit prefers to come and tug at our hearts with a promise of excitement and expectation and hope and something better than what sin's given you. I believe with all my heart, no matter who you are, Jesus has something better for you if you're not a Christian, if you'll come to him. But he said, if you reject that, then the Spirit will come to you in a more serious, a more sober, a more solemn way. And while I personally feel that the Holy Ghost doesn't necessarily come to just scare us, some of us need to get serious. Some of us do need to realize that life itself, of course, is not a joke. Yesterday morning, the first thing I noticed on my phone was a message. This morning, Dad passed away. Dad was my uncle. On my, my side of the family, my last uncle. Herb had been the, Herb was, was a Baptist. He didn't see eye to eye with our theology, but Herb was the only relative I ever had to my recollection that growing up before I got saved ever tried to talk to me about Jesus. He always was interested in me. He always was concerned about me. And just recently down in a long ways away in Mississippi, I won't be able to go down, he got cancer. And way too quickly, he wasted away. And yesterday morning, the first note I got on a day that I went to a wedding, I was reminded that the opposite of weddings is funerals. And when the Holy Spirit comes to you and convicts you and it troubles you and kind of scares you, it's not because God is cruel. I'm convinced that's not the way he prefers to do it. But before he'll let you go to hell, he'll do that. He'll remind you of the brevity of life. Some of us are getting old enough that people shouldn't be overly surprised if we go quicker than some of the others here. And I don't like to scare either, but the truth is a little boy can go to heaven. A young dad can step out of this world. Back home, the Gordons would have known him. A fine young Christian boy, a teenager, took the trash out to burn it at home. How many times had he done that in his life? Who knows? But that day, one of his sisters apparently had a hairspray can. And those pressurized cans, when he threw that into the fire, it blew, it exploded. And these are one of the things we don't understand, people. I have no answer for this at all. But that can became a missile 
and took that young boy right through the throat and sliced, and cut his throat. And when his brother come running and held him in his hands, he said, I'm dying. I'm going to heaven. Goodbye. And in his brother's hands died, bled to death. I don't like to say that kind of stuff. I don't like to scare anybody. It's not my motive to scare people to an altar. But Jesus is the one that said in the marketplace, the little boys and girls said, we want to play wedding. But if you won't play wedding, then we'll play funeral. But we want you to play. The final thing I'd remind this little church of and tell you in this revival is that Jesus wants you to get on board. Jesus wants you to go with him. In the islands, they tell me there's a song they like to sing, come and go with me to my father's house. Come and go with me to my father's house. Little boys and girls are saying, come and go with us. We'll play wedding. Oh, if you won't play wedding, we'll play funeral, but come and be a part. But Jesus said this about us. We are prone to put it off. We have a tendency to say no. And when we do, it hinders the heart of God from reaching us because he'll respect your will. He won't force you. Nothing I preach tonight is to try to scare you, but while we were singing tonight, the Spirit came and illustrated what I've tried to tell you, that from here, 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 we could step out and come. Amongst friends, we could come and pray, and Jesus come to us. In closing of this revival, I remind you, every one of you, excluding nobody, what an honor, what a privilege for me to have the opportunity to try to share with you as best and as simply as I know how but it's up to you. It's up to me. We can say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Or we can say, no, Lord, I choose to think about it some other day. As we stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed in this last invitation of this revival, I simply ask you, is there anybody here that, that the Spirit is extending an invitation to you? Is there anybody here that ought to come and pray? Uh, before you go home, we've got lots of time to do it. We'd be more than happy to spend some time with you to help you to pray, to let Jesus have his way in your in your heart. I'm so glad one day they said to me, the Spirit said to me, come and be a part. And I did. Not anything I did, but I responded to him and he changed my life entirely. Is there somebody here, a man or a woman, a dad or a mom, or a boy or girl, or a young person that needs to pray tonight before we finally go in this revival. We just pause for you. I'm content to let you take it as a warning and take it and think about it, but I'm just telling you if you need to pray, the altar's open for you tonight, and I'd like to invite you to come. Amen, brother. Bless your heart. Bless your heart.
I'm so glad that they've been setting up here to the front and so glad to meet them and so glad to have our brother come. Bless your heart, sister. That's yeah, okay, Wes, you come. It's just us tonight and God. If he's holding his arms out to you, do you need to respond to him? God bless you, sister. So good to see a husband and a wife to come. Do you need to come? Do you need to come and pray together or pray for one another? We're going to soon gather in, but the invitation's open to you. Is there anybody else that needs to come to the altar or to the front seats? Man or woman, boy or girl, do you need to come tonight to Jesus? Jesus said, ye would not. Ye would not. And when we will not, he can't help us. But if we will, there's victory in Jesus. Anybody else want to come and pray quickly? We're going to gather in and pray with these that are here. Amen. You've been a great crowd to preach to. Thank you for the honor of being able to be here with you. Work together. Love one another. Trust God to help you. And there's good things in store for you in the days to come. Amen. Let's gather in. Let's pray with these around the altar. Let's ask God to help them. We'll be remembering you as we go and try to remember you in prayer. You do the same for us. Father in heaven, meet with us here at the close of this revival. Meet with us around the altar, these that are here. Oh, God, we're glad that you give us chance. Many of us, you've given us more than one chance. And we thank you for everybody that's here tonight. Lord, would you please go with them? Would you keep your hand upon them? Would you help them, Lord? Even in, at home, they can, they can bow their head and bow their heart before you and find you as their Savior. Oh, God, I pray. Keep your hand upon us now. Go with us. Again, help these at the altar. Give them victory, Lord. And for what you do, we'll be grateful and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.